hopefully you've managed to get some caffeine or coffee into you and relieve the effects of last night. So um, next up we've got one of our international speakers. So we've got uh, Mark Dennis from uh, Facebook and he's going to be talking about building a scalable network event executor. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mark. Um, let's wait for the slides. Um, yeah, so um, as I was introduced, my name is Mark. I work at Facebook. I work in the whole organization called NetEng Network Engineering. Um, I'm in the team which, uh, which is responsible for our synthetic monitoring network uh, systems. So basically, we, we just inject samples and uh, you know, some synthetic traffic and we're trying to some fault and isolate the faults. But today, actually, I wanted to talk about something else, slightly different, but heavily used at, uh, in our, uh, well, relatively big infrastructure. And this is the, we call this the Golang Automatic Remediation because Go is also very, very hot these days, right? I'm speaking on behalf of myself and my friend, Daniel. Uh, we both work in the, in the AGIS, AGIS and teams. Um, and like, yeah, so um, basically the, what I'm talking about is like the execution of a framework for D network because like we call our networks D networks as well. So usually like our philosophy at Facebook is like, you know, you don't build something for sake of building. I mean, it's fine sometimes uh, when you have like lots of time, but usually we try to solve, you know, we ask ourselves what are the problems and like, you know, then we try to apply some kind of you know, solutions for this, right? So like what bites us? So we actually um, go our, this, uh, this, this execution framework is something we, um, it's not something which we use like, you know, like directly in our production, but like it pretty much reflects our approach and like what, what we are, what we are actually just using in production, right? The reason for this is like, you know, Facebook, as you may know, uh, has like, we have our own kind of, kind of world inside our infrastructure. So it wouldn't be even easy to just, you know, just take one, one system, just open source it or do just push it to the public and like, you know, without, uh, without all those de uh, dependencies, right? So we, we kind of like decided that like, you know, we can build a POC, uh, which pretty much just resembles with the architecture uh, requirements and the, um, you know, how we think about building such systems. Um, and like, you know, just make an open source, build it from scratch, but build like a, something which, 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 which is very, very similar. And also the, like, you know, use some established open source projects. So like, you know, it can be used not only at Facebook, right? So one reason was like, yeah, POC. The other was like collaboration. So obviously sharing is caring. So, you know, if you give something to, to your colleagues, if, if you share this, if you share some lessons learned with them, you may also like, you know, just help them and like, you know, make some people's life easier. That's one thing. But also you may actually just get some feedback, get some requests and like, you know, they may actually just, uh, just, 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 just raise some points that, like, you know, we we didn't we didn't like think about, right? So like, eventually, like, you know, this is for the greater good for for pretty much everybody. So when we were actually just starting thinking about like how we, how do we like make this make this project and like you know which basically was was built for 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 the open source community, uh, we felt like okay, what are our needs? So again, like you know, what's the problem? What's the, what are our needs? And like, how do we want to tackle this? Uh, so yeah, obviously we started with the uh, with something which is like called simple architecture because, uh, like I personally can tell you that like I'm I'm sure you, like everybody knows this that like you know the more experienced engineers are like they aim they are aiming into like more simpler and like you know uh, less complicated architectures right so we also thought like well yeah like you know let's let's tackle the problem with some simple architecture and like because like if we don't have to over over engineer something like why would we do this right. So yeah, this was one of the requirements, but on the other hand, like we wanted to make it highly scalable, right? And obviously again, like there are like a lots of books and uh, like lots of people earned their PhDs for like, you know, uh, different uh, scalability, like, uh, you know, techniques and like problems and all this, uh, all, all, the, all this stuff. But like, again, again let's not, let's not over, over engineer something. Let's not complicate things because unless we really have to, right? And like, turns out that like, you know, very simple engineering approaches can, can really fit most of the problems, right? Um, the next thing was like we wanted to make the thing concurrent. So you know, even this laptop, which is like not the not the newest laptop, uh, it, it's like it has like more more CPUs than more than one CPU, right? Like core at least. So like you know, like the, the hardware is like supporting concurrency. So, like why why don't we also like you know try to just um, just use it because like you know like this is just a laptop, right? I'm not even talking about the enterprise uh, you know servers. Um, and obviously, like, you know, the, the problem we are having, like, we are trying to just ease or, like, appro approach is, like, uh, most of the times, like, the system can work on, like, many completely independent, uh, you know, uh, tasks. So, like, why not make it concurrent by design? Uh, we also wanted to make it modular. So, like, uh, the, the execution is, 
the, I mean, the guard is like the framework, so basically something which, like some kind of baseline which, which should be easily tweaked and uh, something which, which you should be able to use like, you know, in your, in your infrastructure, infrastructure without having to rewrite half of the code because like of the hard codes and like, and like you know, the, because of the design, right? And this also brings us to the kind of flexibility. So like, you know, if you, if you just want to, again, like tweak it for your infrastructure, you should be able to just make some configuration. You should be able to, you know, add some plugins, things like this, and like just, just use it, right? Without like too many uh, changes, I mean, without actually any changes in, uh, in directly in the core code. So what are the building blocks in the whole ar architecture? So before I just I just jump into those technic technicalities, like you know, uh, the the whole execution framework could potentially be seen as a kind of like a you know um, pipeline, which where, where where we have some kind of input and like you know we just react to some input, and uh, you know you you could typically think of the kind of uh, let's say the this uh, this kind of like a piece of software trying to just automate uh, automate uh, like a kind of mundane and like you know super super boring tasks that uh, you know all of us have because everybody who runs some infrastructure network i know some server services and all this all this stuff like you know yeah, we we also we usually have to share the on call rotas and like there's part of this interesting job where usually we just build something uh, we just design something and like sometimes where there's things breaks and we have to just you know fix them fix them right and obviously like especially in companies like uh, in, or infrastructures like facebook like you know we cannot uh, scale uh, our 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 manpower linearly with the infrastructure. So infrastructure is growing super super fast, and we cannot just keep adding people. Plus, like you know, we just don't want them to sit down and like you know restart routers or servers like all the time, right? So that's why we are we are kind of like also building those the, 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 this this kind of software, and like hopefully you can also find it um, useful in your companies, organizations, infrastructures. Uh, so again, like if we if we let's say imagine like we have the operator who is in charge of the let's say network um, in the company and like obviously like um, obviously like you know um, he or she will probably just have to just watch some alerts maybe some tickets maybe just sometimes read some syslogs and uh, like most of the problems or like many many of those problems are like just well defined right so like you know something happens we get some let's say some some log from the from the syslog server and we know like exactly what to do and when, when we actually know what to do um, why, why don't we just try to automate it so the people who receive, who people on call, like you know, can get into some more interesting troubleshooting sessions, or they can just go back to working on some fancy project, right? So let's say that uh, you know, operator is like you know, get, he or she is getting some input. So again, like syslog. So that's why one of the building blocks will be the tailor. Uh, so something which which injects data into into the system and just transforms this into the the requests or like the objects which are just understood by other uh, building blocks of the of the whole execution framework, right? And uh, we call this Taylor because like we also call them like internally at Facebook. Um, um, my idea is like it's probably because the, uh, uh, because, because of the, of the, of the Linux, uh, uh, you know, binary called tail where you can just type the tail minus F and some file and then you will just be constantly just reading the data, reading the data. And this is pretty much like what's the, what the tailor is supposed to do. So, you know, it may just query some database, wait for some events, just query the syslog file or just query the syslog server. I don't know, maybe even query some, some devices, right? So once actually we just ingest this data into our system, we are passing this to the processors. And like, again, if we go back to this uh, uh, analogy of like the operator, so like operator just, it's, it's just waiting for some events. And then like, you know, once they actually just match some event, they will see, oh, okay, I know that like something is happening in my network. So now I know this because like, let's say this is like well-known issue and this, it hasn't been, it, it hasn't still been fixed like, I, I know I have to do something, so maybe I need to just drain the device. Maybe I just need to, I don't know, do something, whatever, right? So the processor is like doing, doing this kind of step where it's trying to match uh, the input with the, with the well-known rules. And like the way we do this in the system is like we have the, you know, the configuration where we, we can just specify some rejects in, our, uh, in this implementation. And then once the rejects actually match, we have like a defined set of actions where we, which, are, which will be like the, the remediation of the um, you know, of this particular incident in the network or the whole in infrastructure, right? And then like, you know, once, once we actually know that we, once we know that we have to do something, we like, we've got like audits and like the, the real jobs and remediation. So let's say, you know, something is happening. I need to just drain this, this device. But can I always drain this device? Well, probably not because like, you know, if I just, if I don't keep some rate limiting, I just start blindly just, just draining the devices. 
perhaps I would just cut off like the whole, I don't know, pod or cluster in the data center, right? So perhaps I need to just, uh, you know, check if just draining this device will just, let, will just leave me with like enough capacity uh, in this particular pod, given like if, if we have, you know, enough redundancy, right? Uh, and the job remediation in our, in our nomenclature is something like, well, yeah, just okay, just go and drain this device, right? So these are like kind of, um, and again, like, you know, if you think about the, the, the typical like uh, operator's job, it would be like, okay, something happened. I know what happened, I know what to do, now I will just do this. And sometimes I need to just check something, right? So um, these are the, um, you know, uh, like th this, this is how we tr tr try to tr transform this into, into the software, right? So, so the use cases, so I pretty much like described already one typical use case, so that would be like a, you know, execution workflow, something happened and we need to react to this. And if this is like well modeled, like, you know, we can just, just put it off to the software and like start doing something fancy because, well, we are still much more creative than the machines. And machines on the other hand are great in like doing the same jobs over and over. Uh, so like, you know, yeah, user system, uh, some, if something happens, perhaps we need to just execute a couple of actions. You know, two of those actions may actually fail. Perhaps we just need to, on, perhaps then like somebody will just need to uh, take a look. Uh, but like on the other hand, like very often, like all the actions will, we're pretty much just, you know, succeed and like we just get the, you know, some lock in the, in the logbook um, and so we can just track them some metrics and things like this, right? And human doesn't need to be like involved in this at all. The other, the other uh, typical use case would be like, you know, checking the state. So perhaps, uh, you know, you may just want to trigger this, the whole system and check the, if the f uh, firmware upgrade on like, you know, tens of your routers in your infrastructure was actually upgraded, right? So instead of doing this like one by one, which is probably the worst idea, or even like, you know, trying to do this, uh, you know, in a loop in the, in the script, you can use this, uh, you know, execution framework and like, um, you know, uh, take advantage of the, like all these kind of like a requeuing things, like if, if things that uh, don't go very, very well because of some, for instance, transient errors, right? Uh, yeah, and like, I will just slowly go into the, um, uh, the whole architecture and, the, and the a bit more details of the, of the system. How was it actually implemented, but like before, uh, I mentioned that this is like a called GAR, uh, Go uh, uh, autom uh, Automatic Remediation. And uh, like I would just, I just wanted to just also like um, say a couple of words about the, the, the Go. Um, so I know that like especially the networking world is like ruled by Perl, nowadays probably Python. Um, however, like, you know, we did this in Go. Um, and uh, I personally think this is like a, the language is like right fit for the infrastructure. Well, actually it was also designed for the infrastructure. so. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of obvious, but like, if you have a chance, like, you know, I would actually also advise looking at the language. Uh, you may actually find it very, very useful and, uh, and uh, you know, very productive. So basically, like, Go is very, very simple language uh, with basic building blocks. So like, it doesn't really take long to actually become productive and start, uh, start like, you know, writing in, in, the, in, the, in the language. It was designed for portability and speed. Uh, so usually it's like, you know, it's, it's even faster than Python if you really need this. Um, it's uh, like the concurrency is like, you know, built and it's, it's, it's deep in the language, right? So like, if you have to deal with the threads or like even async IO in Python, um, well, I had to. And uh, you know, after I switched to Go at some point, like I was, it was, it, it was a great relief, right? Uh, so like, uh, and usually like, you know, many, many problems, especially in the infrastructure can be modeled like with, with the concurrency, um, you know, like if you, if you start, start, if you start thinking about like the concurrent approaches, uh, it turns out that many problems may be modeled in a like, very, very easy and concise, concise uh, piece of code. Uh, it's obviously garbage collected, so, um, you know, just like Python, Perl, and like most of those languages, like, you know, you just, you don't have to worry about, like, you know, allocating the allocating memory, like you would in, for instance, C++. Uh, and something which is, like, uh, which I find very, very useful, it's statically typed. So, like, you know, in Python, you can just, your function or method you connect, expect like dictionary or, or array, you, you can pass whatever you want. And like, if you don't unit test this, you will have the, you know, repercussions like while running on production, right? Here it's something different because like, if you, if you said like, well, this function expects like string, integer, and the array of something like, you know, and you pass something else by mistake or like, you know, by, by just doing the fat finger thing, uh, you know, it's not even going, going to compile, right? So this is extremely useful if, uh, you know, if you, um, if you work in a team and like, you know, the code base grows and uh, it's, it's becoming like, you know, you cannot just really remember everything. So that's, that's this for the, for the advertising of, of the Go. Uh, and yeah, like uh, the whole framework, yeah. the whole framework is, uh, is open source. So this is on our um, GitHub, uh, uh, GitHub uh, webpage, like you can give it a try uh, if you, 
if you find it interesting. Um, obviously, the pull requires issues, and uh, uh, you know, are, are more than more than welcomed. We'll just look at them like as uh, as soon as uh, as possible. So yeah, again, like you know, given the building blocks, given the problem, given like what we are actually are trying to achieve, um, what is the architecture of the whole system? Um, so basically, this is something like that. Uh, but like I also like mentioned that like at the, at the beginning that one of the of the requirements was like yeah it should be highly scalable right so and the beauty of this kind of like a even like the simple approaches for the scalability and like why we actually did just did this the way we did was like because like essentially like you know it can it can actually be easily displayed into something like this right so like multi multi stage pipeline where you can just throw more machines more processes more I don't know containers whatever. And then, like you know, you can just have, you can just have more processors, more tiders, more uh, executors, because actually these are the the three components that we that we that we had to just you know um, design and implement. Uh, we decided to use like the the queues because like you know in the distributed uh, systems world like everybody loves queues. Uh, we decided to use Ruby MQ because this is like a well-known, established uh, you know you know queuing system, so it's super super easy to use. And obviously, like audits and jobs are. Are pretty much like you know what you want to execute in your infrastructure, right? Because essentially, like you know, you own the infra, you own the device, you know, you you know your setup, you know how to, you know, what's the host schemes, uh, and like, you know, you know what to do, right? The the whole goal is like just just the kind of framework which gives you some kind of tools for you to make this job easy. And obviously, like you know, you may actually ask a question like, okay, why would you why would you do this like in the couple, kind of like a decoupled components which are like queued together, and uh, why not just make it uh, you know in one single monolithic binary? So, uh, just like I said, it's for, it's mainly for the for the scaling uh, purposes. Uh, it's like you know you can just throw more processors, more uh, more tailors, uh, and then like you know you you, you don't need to just uh, you can just distribute this like across your machines. Um, so you know this is this is kind of like a very very easy approach, but like it works in most of the cases. Uh, okay, so demos like you know the demo will be will be more like kind of a bit static uh, because of, of some VPN issues uh, in our lab, but basically like the uh, what's what's on the what's on the GitHub page is something like uh, something which I pretty much described in the um, you know at the very beginning. So like you know let's uh, let's actually build something which is which just reacts to some. Uh, to some, uh, you know, incidents uh, being logged uh, via via the syslog server. So basically, like you know, in our typical infrastructure, we would have like a network devices which which send all the logs to the syslog server. Then we would have like a syslog tailor uh, tailor which which reads from the syslog server. It just waits for the new logs incoming. Then we obviously have like a set of rules uh, defined in the in the configuration file. Um, the processor will just, you know, just try to match those rules with the events, and once it actually just, you know, just matches this, it knows it sends the request to the executor, which, which deals with like, you know, calling the uh, audits uh, and the and the remediation jobs, um, and then you know, like something happens, and like hopefully we can just mitigate or like fix the, the problem uh, which was which was raised by the device, right? Uh, so again, like you know, let's go to this to this descaled version of the of the of the framework. And let's say that, like you know, like uh, Taylor just reads let, like this one line. Uh, this this one line happens. So like, you know, the like uh, this line protocol on the interface, uh, you know, six twelve one, and that it changed this down to state. So this is pretty much we know more or less what to do, right? You would like to just perhaps try to just put it up, and uh, if if it doesn't work, perhaps I don't know, maybe maybe just raise some tickets so the so the um, you know p uh, person who is on call needs to take a look, right? So the tailor is actually responsible for understanding and knowing how to get this data from the syslog server, right? Um, you could also like, well, as I said, like, you know, read data from file or just from the, um, you know, a database, um, you know, Im imagination is like the, you know, is, is limitless, right? So basically like we are, um, uh, you know, we are, we are sending this to the processor and processor happens to actually have this redux because like the way the system works is like we are trying to match the rejects, right? So the processor is like, you know, having this rejects here. Uh, and we happen to actually match, right? And then, then we know that the, the remediation we have like configured is like, you know, running this port down arista.py. Uh, I will just mention like, uh, you know, how to run those remediations uh, in a minute. Uh, but basically like this is like, you know, action reaction um, kind of chain, right? 
And uh, obviously, like uh, like this this script, this port down Arista py that py should be like generic enough, so it should like, just be able to you know just execute this action on every host or every every network device like in our infrastructure. So we should perhaps know what's the host name, or like at least let's say that in this in this example we we have to know at least like you know what's the interface. So that's why we are calling those like named rejects. Uh, because later what's, what the processor is going to do, it will pretty much just build the, um, the command to be run along with the, um, you know, with all those parameters. So, so basically the processor is going to match this, uh, this line with, or this incident with the rule, and it's going to create something, some, you know, JSON, um, we use, uh, J JSON, JSON request to the, to the executor, and then it will say like, you know, just call this port down Arista hostname uh, with this interface. So let's say that uh, hostname is actually just, uh, you know, like a, this is like a lab, so, so, so this is, um, um, this is like a uh, hard coded in this in this particular case, but, it's, but basically like this is what the executor gets again, and then what the executor does is knows okay I need to just run the extra process like the new process with those parameters right so it it runs port down Arista hostname test device interface at Ethernet six one um, six twelve one, and then uh, you know this is where just your magic happens because as I said like you know your infrastructure and like hopefully like you know we just can mitigate we can mitigate this. Uh, this uh, this problem this problem with, with the port. If if the thing doesn't work uh, because of some transient errors, like it can be recute. It also depends on the how you want to uh, configure um, the whole framework and the and the queues. Uh, if it works, uh, you know it can uh, it will it will it will just it will just just raise that everything is fine. And uh, even though the the whole system is written in Go, uh, you can see that like you know here the, the remediation job is the the Python script. It could be pretty much everything because essentially what executor does is it just runs the the separate process, right? So given like like usually it looks in the in the directory called remediations in the in the in the, in the project directory, uh, and it, it just it just tries to I mean it just executes the, the script. So you know um, if you're using today like some Python scripts, Perl scripts, I don't know C plus plus. Uh, binaries, uh, you can easily just just you know just merge this and tie this into this into this framework. And again, this is like uh, for the simplicity and like kind of like flexibility because you, you are not tied to the new yet another new technology and you don't have to rewrite everything in your in your infra. And we also like in Facebook we use many many languages, so you know many of them work for for years, right? Mm. Speaking of the um, you know how the executor is actually running the. Uh, how the executor is, is running those those remediations or the audits, um, like executed like like the only contract between the the framework and the script is like you know you need to be able to pass all the parameters so I don't know host name or like the interface name, or you know anything which is like a, which is like non non constant via the uh, command line um, uh, arguments like here. Um, if you want to just 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 uh, produce some kind of like a debug errors or anything like this, so m perhaps later human would like to read, you need to just uh, output this to the standard error, and the only thing that should be outputted to the standard output is like the um, the JSON structure, uh, which will be later parsed by the executor, and then we know okay, what was the return code of the process? What was the like whether did the what was the results? Or perhaps, like you know, you may s if you're upgrading the, the firmware, you may want to see like, okay, no, not okay, right? Uh, we also like passing whether like the whole s uh, job succeeded. Per like you know, like okay, maybe I just didn't, um, you know, the f the upgrade didn't didn't went well, didn't go well, right? Uh, so this is the only thing that executor is expecting. Uh, this should be the only thing which which uh, which we pretty much uh, which which we in our like remediation jobs should be producing to the standard output. Uh, so yeah, so this was one uh, one use case. The other one uh, was, uh, and again, this was kind of like an action reaction, uh, you know, workflow, which which can like automate like lots of lots of mundane tasks. Uh, oh. uh, the other is the like perhaps we want to do something at scale. So like perhaps we want to do the, you know, we want to check, uh, like, uh, call some audits. So audits audits like, are something like you know let's let's check if it works and let's let's go back. Let's I mean give me the the results. Like did the you know upgrade work in all of my uh, network devices, right? So I don't want to do this one by one. I might want to use this framework. Um, and obviously, like, you know, what would be the trigger? So the trigger can be like me, right? I might just want to just have a CLI, perhaps even just inject the, the JSON directly into, into the queue. Or uh, I may want to just write my own tailor, so I would just expose some RPC. Uh, I can perhaps, you know, um, you know, just implement some kind of like a authentication uh, authorization, uh, you know, uh, system. So like not everybody can, 
you know, suddenly in the middle of su on the night just starts upgrading the the whole fleet, right? Because this would be this wouldn't be very very wise. Uh, so like you know, you can you can also like make it like a like a clear um, you know CLI calls um, and uh, um, and like just 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 trigger the events yourself. Uh, you may also just want to let's say like not only just check if something worked, but like you know just just have the uh, have the um, you know the the configuration of the device like doing the, being done at scale. So like you know obviously like if something doesn't work, like you know the the framework is trying to to um, you know just retry this, given the the, the errors are transients. And again like uh, it's 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 like it's it's much, much easier to do this and like even just run this periodically rather than like just running your own scripts, you know, even in the loop because we, we also implemented a bit of like error handling and all this stuff. So, um, you know, like it, this, most of the techniques for this are like, are usually like very, very common. So, uh, you know, using, using this as a framework and like being able to just, you know, just trigger this yourself, um, you know, using eventually like the code or so something you, I mean, use running eventually your code or running something which, which you know, um, it just may just like you know merge uh, pretty 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 good, and uh, as I said like we, this is kind of approach we've been using like at our scale. So we obviously have like you know multiple regions, multiple data centers, um, and um, yeah, so far like you know everybody is happy with this, um, and like probably without having this kind of software, um, you know we we wouldn't be able to to run um, our you know our network in a, in a semi uh, or like you know even more uh, automatized way. So um, yeah, so this is Gar. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I um, I will be hanging around here. I've got the EBB T-shirt, um, and like uh, that's all for me. Thank you. Any questions? Seems not. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, so next up we've got um, Tony from um, Netscout or Arbor, yeah. and he's talking about DDoS uh, defense. And that'll be back on the normal presenter laptop. Hi, good morning. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, my name's Tony Scheid, uh, Netscout Arbor. I look after Australia New Zealand uh, and based in Sydney. So. Uh, Let's have a little bit of a talk about um, some of the threat report information that we've garnered over the first and second half of uh, 2018. Uh, this threat report that we've done, um, I've managed to cajole the guys to give me some, some uh, Australian New Zealand data for, uh, for the second half. So the second half report will come out around February. Then we'll talk a little about some trending of DDoS uh, attack vectors that we've seen throughout uh, the 2018 time period. And I'll talk a little bit about our uh, research guys and some of the, the need of visibility that they're going to try and provide to see more and more about these emerging threats. Um, that's where you can get the threat report if you want to get it. Looking at first half 2018, some of the global stats that we picked up here, uh, we saw an infinitely large number of attacks occurring. Uh, this is where we saw our 1.72 terabit attack uh, early on in 2018, which was an increase of around 24 per cent from 2017. Uh, the attack frequency has decreased slightly, however volume has increased. Um, they're harder hitting attacks now, there's obviously larger uh, uh, sizes available. Um, we're seeing more attacks in the multi hundred gig uh, uh, than, than, than has uh, been usual. For those of you who remember Memcached, that's one of the explanations for this. However, there, there's a, a bigger explanation, which is the rapid weaponization of these particular attack vectors into the booter stressor services. So just to quickly look at some of the first half data for Australia and New Zealand, uh, we observed about 68,000 attacks coming into both continents, about 103 terabits, around uh, 1.5 gig average attack size. In, in first half, about three attacks were larger than 100 gig. For corresponding uh, uh, 2017, there was 87,000 inbound attacks, about 114 terabits, uh, average attack of about 1.3 and one attack exceeding 100 gigs. Congratulations, we also were the source involved in over 140 
uh, plus 100 gig attacks. So our subscribers and, and uh, uh, people connected to our network are participating in this uh, environment. Sorry, whoops, clicker's gone wild. Uh, second half uh, of uh, 2018, with 130,000 inbound attacks, uh, around 182 terabits uh, average attack still sitting around the 1.3, uh, 1.4, 13 attacks larger than 100 gigs, uh, and, and correspondingly back to first half. So 130,000 versus 68,000 inbound on the uh, first half. Carpet bombing. So whilst not new, uh, it has become weaponised, so therefore we're seeing more and more of this. So CARPA bombing, basically, uh, this has challenges for detection systems because a lot of detection systems are host-based, so we're looking at traffic towards a given slash 32, for example. Mitigation becomes a challenge because you can't start diverting large siders through mitigation devices. <clears throat> we have seen this before. Uh, in the hands of the more skilled attacker. However, again, as I mentioned, with the weaponisation of this into boot stressor services, we are starting to see more and more uh, of these types of attacks. So what does it look like? We have an attacker that basically attacks large aggregate address space. So a slash 20, for example, in a 16. Quite often what they'll do is they'll attack that with a particular flood. They'll do that for two, three, four minutes, and then they'll move to an entirely different slash 20 within that 16. So whilst you challenge to detect this, and by the time you get around to trying to mitigate it, they've already moved. So an example there, SSDP amplification. Uh, let's say I've got my, my triggering rate set at four megabits. Um, a 40 gig attack into a slash 18 is gonna be an aggregate of 2.5 megabits against a given host. So I'm not even gonna detect that. Um, the other issue with a lot of these types of reflection amplification attacks is the prevalence of non-initial fragments. So they be themselves become a challenge. I'll talk a little bit about what we can do to, to mitigate against those. Detection is difficult because we can't use host-based triggering anymore. So we need to look at things like baselining of aggregate network traffic, baselining of routers, baselining of interfaces, and being able to do that in a peacetime scenario, being able to do that with time of day, day of week values, so that we know what is considered to be normal. Mitigation, uh, again, some challenges here. Um, because it is still a typical reflection amplification, we can still use things like BGP flow spec, uh, source-based remote trigger black hole. Um, we can do rate limiting of non-initial fragments, and we've found that you can get down to some very low values without uh, uh, causing detriment to other traffic that has got uh, uh, non-initial fragments. However, when you're doing those sorts of activities, you clearly need to make sure that you exempt your own DNS and other trusted uh, DNS sources such as Google, OpenDNS, et cetera. Diverting traffic to an intelligent DDoS mitigation system is another scenario. However, again, be mindful of overwhelming that if you don't want to be diverting an entire slash 16 through a, uh, an IDMS. Need a new battery in your clicker. <laughs> okay. So SSDP, um, a new or maybe not so new twist. Um, there was a paper that was published around SSDP diffraction. Uh, a, another entity identified this supposedly new twist. It's been around for a while. Um, basically, if we, whoops, if we look at a standard SSDP re uh, reflection, we've got our client to our destination port 1900. Our reply packet is source port 1900 to our victim. All fairly standard, fairly easy. Just to recap what reflection amplification looks like, bad guy down on the left finds a bunch of open resolving type devices, sends a bunch of queries to them, all the reply packets go back to the, the intended victim as, as he spoofed that IP address. However, our research team has identified some weirdness. Not all of these replies are coming back on 1900, so there's randomised source port in the reply. So being a research team, let's go have a look. They went and found two million devices. I don't know the length of time this took. Uh, over 50% of those, or over half of those, were found to be misbehaving. Some of the key things they found out of that was in the user agent field, and you'll notice the predominance of this red sonic up in the, up in the right hand side there. Further investigation, they found that the culprit, sorry, the culprit is a broken libupnp. 
So a lot of the router vendors, uh, home router vendors this is, um, are basically taking broken code base and they're all using the same broken code base and in this instance you'll see they don't even bother to change the user agent field. That can be handy coming up with, for mitigation. So detection, now you've got a challenge. You can't use port 1900 anymore. You can still use flow-based telemetry. You can look for floods of UDP. So again, that could come from baselining your network traffic, baselining your routers, baselining interfaces. Mitigation, same scenarios. You can use source-based remote trigger black hole. You can use pattern matching. Rate limiting of UDP fragments, as mentioned previously. Uh, and again, you can use intelligent DDoS mitigation systems. So perhaps regexes against user agents and things of that nature. One of the scarier things they found was the ability to game the uh, broken, misconfigured mini uh, uh, UPnP implementation in these. They were able to successfully go from a public IP address using TCP quad 2 and go through the NATed device to an RFC 1918 address space and log into a SSH, SSH shell on a Linux box which is sitting behind a NAT device from a public internet. That's scary. So out of the implementation, this is a sort of a breakdown. Congratulations, New Zealand, you beat Australia. Um, so basically here, this is the prevalence of these, these vendors that are using this broken code base, okay? So you want to connect to your ISP's internet, you go to your local electronics store, you go and buy yourself a home router which has got this broken code base on it, you plug it into your home network and then connect to the ISP and you are now a broken node on that ISP network. Let's talk about memcache. <clears throat> so memcache, it's obviously that. It's a memory caching system used by a lot of database web server combinations. Uh, unfortunately, memcache is the default implementation. There's no authentication mechanism. And the device listens on all interfaces on TCP UDP 11211. Combine that with spoofed IPs, and you get a 1.72 ter uh, terabit attack. The standard methodology of memcache is to use a stats command that will yield you about a 1 to 19 amplification factor. So merely issue that command with your victim's IP spoofed and you'll get that. In the lab, we were able to do even better. We were able to basically inject our own keys into the, into the device as a cache and then fundamentally what that gave us was a key length greater than 1400 bytes. So we could then issue one attack packet request, which includes, give me those keys, 729 times, which yielded over half a million packet reply at 6.2 gig, two packets, 12 gig, three packets, 18 gig, about a one and a half million factor of amplification. You can't be bothered doing that, use the tool. <laughs> so the good news about memcache is it's always port 11211 and there are no fragments. So if you see 11211 traffic in the network, drop it. It should never be there in the first place. So you are able to still use flow-based telemetry for detection and then mitigation, of course, you've still got your traditional scenarios of source-based uh, remote trigger black hole, flow spec, uh, infrastructure ACLs, I won't say ACLs, I saw that comment in Slack. Um, exploitable filters, now that is not what you might think it's termed as, it's not an exploitable filter, it's not a filter that can be exploited, it's a filter of port protocol combinations that can be exploited. So an example here, you can place these types of filters on the uh, egress, ingress parts of your network to block this type of traffic or rate limit this type of traffic. Okay. Need for visibility. So this is really what the, the ACERT team, so that's my other uh, security engineering research team, are looking at doing. We want to be able to see through the fog. Definitely need new batteries in this thing. <laughs> okay, so they're looking at doing things like monitoring, uh, infiltration of uh, botnets, things of that nature. Oops. Can you advance that at all? Oh. See, pick on the Aussie in the room. Here we go. Slowly getting there. 
Um, we want to basically lure attackers into, into giving us their, their precious little secrets. We want to pretend to be that compromised IoT device so that they send us malware and we go, fantastic, thanks, we can reverse engineer that, find out what's happening, learn the command and control infrastructure and the language. One more. <laughs> okay, welcome to the terabit era. Um, so, summarily, attackers are, are, are harder hitting. Um, the operators in the room, you should be looking at implementing security BCPs. Um, scan your network, learn what's in, uh, out there on the network. Block rate limit the, uh, the known threats using those filters. Um, I think one of the more important points out of this is, is get these vendors to stop using broken code base. Use your RFP process, procurement processes, regulations, whatever it may be, until you can prevent these guys having broken code base and having the standard CPE user just plug that into the network, you're just going to continue to have this massive uh, attack surface available within the network that can be used against you and it can be used against others. The other thing, take advantage of operational security communities, NZ NOG, vendors like myself, threat feeds, etc. in terms of gaining intel about what's happening, what's emerging, what's being discovered and plan ahead of time before these things actually impact your network. Sorry, last slide anyway, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I said it was the last slide anyway. <laughs> Any one quest questions? Deathly silence. Uh, a couple of things. The uh, firstly is that is anybody maintaining um, shit lists of, of, uh, of, 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 of vendors that are doing the uh, deploying this crap? Yes, there are lists available. Um, we have lists that, um, and, and not pushing product, but we have lists of, of known uh, reflection amplification uh, IPs. Um, so yes, there are lists available. There are other threat feeds that contain known bad actor lists, yes. I was thinking more in terms of um, the actual uh, things like CPE um, vendors and versions. I would imagine that there are some elements that we would have data in terms of the most compromised versions of those. Um, I, certainly I can make some inquiries for you, Don, if you want. Yeah, sure. Um, and the other one was, um, yeah, the, the SSDP port um, port you're referring to, is that the target port is changing or is it just the, so the, if you were filtering all um, inbound traffic on port 1900, would that stop attack traffic hitting your CPE? No. So that's the reply packet from the device. Yeah. So it's using a randomised source port in the reply. So yeah, I was sorry, it should, I mean, be, I mean, it the, should be 1900, but it's randomising the, the, the port. So you so, can't use 1900 on those devices to, as a detection scenario. I was referring to um, using it to defend your CPE from being a reflector. So if, I have a, if I'm a provider, can I, uh, if I filter port 1900, are uh, the CPEs behind me protected from being used as an amplification device, as a mitigation against crap yes. CPE? Yes, you can certainly do that. Um, and, and for those devices that, you know, so, so again, you should be doing that for things like DNS for open resolvers in the broadband environment, for example, um, NTP, those types of things. So yes, the answer is yes, yes. That, that sort of stuff should be filtered on the ingress coming into the, into the broadband address space, for example. Yeah. Yep. Hi, uh, just in regards to the CPE, um, so you talked about making sure that your CPE vendor was um, technically compliant, I guess, and, and, mm -hmm. and hold them to account. Um, do you know of, or can you recommend a, uh, a list of technical compliance um, uh, uh, 
things. Um, <laughs> that would so, be good. And so, yes. Yeah, we can, we can certainly give you what we know to date uh, as things that are broken in some of these implementations, and I'm sure there will be other uh, groups that can do the same, so building that type of a list would not be a difficult thing to do. Um, and the other thing was, are you aware of any uh, like toolbox that you can run against CPE to test them um, for that compliance? I, not anything specific to them that I'm aware of, but I'm sure that if you were to you know look at even scanning open port uh, uh, protocol combinations, you'll see what is open at least. Um, you know, these vendors need to start turning this stuff off by default. They need to have a, a scenario where you run the, the, you know, the user runs the setup program and it prompts them to change the admin password to something with reasonable strength, because none of that exists, right? So, same scenario for IoT devices, you know, none of those things exist. These, these vendors need to be a little more responsible um, you know, in terms of making sure that that type of stuff is disabled by default. So if you want to have SSDP across the internet for some unknown reason, then you have to manually turn that on yourself as a user. Yep. So um, could I ask a question about egress filtering? So if an operator were to make sure nobody within their network can spoof an IP address going out, would that what percentage of DDoS attacks could be mitigated by just making sure egress filtering is in place? Would you have any numbers on that? Um, well, hopefully you're implementing BCP38 and you're not allowing spoofing, but... Um, but then how's it happening if, if spoofing is not allowed? How's, yeah. how's the DDoS happening at all? So the challenge here, it's not the operator that's got the ability to stop the home PC, for example, from spoofing an IP, uh, uh, the source of an IP to an intended victim. So you can disallow spoofed packets coming into your network, but you can't necessarily control a client inside your network spoofing another victim's IP, no, unless no, you I'm... do something like that on the broadband ingress edge into your network you'd have to enable anti-spoofing there. I'm not sure, very sure I understand. So if I'm an operator and somebody within my network is sending a packet out that is spoofing an IP address belonging to somebody else, I yep. should be filtering that out. So if that is filtered out, then why is a spoof packet <laughs> yep. going out? That's what I'm saying. So, yeah. so if, if you disable the ability for your broadband community, for example, to send spoofed IP, yeah. then you prevent that exact problem you've just described. Correct. Most people, most operators will hopefully be implementing BCPs that don't allow spoof packets coming into the network. However, a lot of them don't care what their own broadband base sends out of the network. Okay. They should do, absolutely, without a doubt. That's the problem. Okay. Any other questions in the room? No, one more up front. Hi. Um, do you have any figures on how much IPv6 is being used on in DOS? Uh, yes, it's not a lot. Um, most attacks are still classic v4. Um, the the surface of v6 is still not large enough that the bad guys get enough bang for buck out of attacking. But there have definitely been V6-style attacks, uh, but they're just not as prevalent. So very, very small, less than 1%, very small. OK. I believe that's all. I think that's it. Thanks Thank you very much. <laughs>
or this is actually one of those incredibly hard kind of problems. You know, so let's just start with the usual kind of crap of disaster porn. And, you know, no matter where, and you've already seen one already, or maybe two so far, you have to mention the YouTube attack. It's just obligatory, right? Um, boring as batshit, really. Um, Ten years old, near, more specific attack, nothing very special. There's de debate whether it was fat finger trouble or a deliberate probe. After ten years, I don't think anyone cares. But, you know, there are lots and lots and lots. Um, what amazes me in some of these reports is this kind of fascination that BGP is so fast that within minutes, it's kind of shit, it took minutes? It should have taken a few seconds. <laughs> What's gone wrong? But anyway, yes, within minutes, disaster happened, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, it happened in Brazil, blah, blah, blah. Um, this is just commonplace. And, and in some ways, you kind of wonder, if I was an attacker, why would I attack with my best shot? I'd keep it. And when I really needed to attack, then I would attack. Most of this I actually think is just straight mishap. Because, you know, routers are complicated, yeah? And, you know, coffee's coming and I wasn't paying any attention. And, you know, I just hit return. And, and most of this stuff comes, I think, just inadvertent slip-ups, one way or another. I, I like this one, though. Um, it's the Australian-centric view of the world. Uh, this routing attack took out a few towns in Australia. Whoopie doo. That was the internet. The entire internet was down because, you know, is there any other internet other than in Australia? Um, <laughs> love it. Um, but the real question, I suppose, is we haven't got any smarter. We, we really haven't got any better at this. It's still insanely easy to actually stuff up the routing of the internet. And, and I suppose I get down into this point of, of if you dig it a bit, why is it insanely easy to cause global mayhem? And why is it so hard to stop it? Now, I don't think anyone in the telco industry planned for the internet to happen. You know, it happened despite those bastards. Um, it was a runaway success and we were just sleeping. It just happened at us all. Yet, bizarrely, after zillions of presentations, numerous hours of you folks sitting there and folk going, you must do V6, V6 hasn't. So how is it that just a minor protocol change makes easy, I just wasn't looking, it just happened, into, my God, it's just not happening. You see, because I think routing security sort of fits into this. So maybe we should look at, at what succeeded, either because we wanted it to, or because we really didn't want it to succeed, it succeeded anyway. So, you know, V4 and the whole datagram thing, and despite MPLS, despite SDN, despite segment routing, virtual circuits are bullshit. If you really want efficient, fast networking, stateless makes everything fast and easy. And that was true 30 years ago, and it's still true today. Stuffing state into your switches leads to cost, not efficiency. And I'll leave it at there. <laughs> and I'm glad I'm speaking after those two the yesterday. Um, <laughs> network address translators, say what you want, you're all behind them. And say what you want, an application that can't run through a NAT isn't on the internet, it just doesn't work. So everything these days is network address translating. How do we have 20 odd billion devices connected to this net and we're using actively around 1.2, 1.3 billion addresses? Meh, NATs. How have we managed to run out of V4 addresses and still run the internet? Meh, NATs. Anyone care? Meh, nah. <laughs> Success. I'm like, what a technology. Um, I actually really, really like TCP. You know, TCP was actually designed and built at a time uh, when 9600 bits per second was considered fast. It's the same basic protocol. You now run down there with your gigs going into houses, and from Australia I'm as jealous as hell and you're all bastards, uh, gigs <laughs> running into houses, and you're still using the same TCP. It just works. You know, that is an amazing piece of engineering. It's like building a bridge that handled one car a day and you're now pumping a few million cars every second. What a piece of engineering. Just total success. 
Um, after, after Sebastian's talk this morning, I'm a little bit concerned about putting the DNS here, but I'll go there anyway. Uh, the DNS is amazing. Uh, it is actually its own evolved life form. You might think that the DNS responds to your request, but that's only part of what this does. At least half of the DNS traffic has no human action involved. It just natters to itself continuously. That is an evolved life form like you wouldn't believe. Um, Content distribution systems, they just happened. They've now become the internet. What a success. Oh, and by the way, we're now the new television company. The only thing we do these days is stream. Nothing else matters anymore. So, you know, these were successes. Some of them were planned, some of them some people planned, and some of them happened despite us, but they were successes. But, you know, that's not all. Why were they successes? Now, that's kind of interesting. I could do it and you didn't have to. That was one of the things. We didn't need to all take one step to the left or one step to the right. Piecemeal deployment, no orchestration. There's no boss on the internet. There's no regulatory authority, despite some people's fantasies. There is no controlling function. Do what you want. If it makes money, do more of it. If it doesn't, maybe it was a really, really bad idea. And that's the simple rule of most of this stuff. The other thing that really makes life work in, in terms of success factors, if I do it and I get richer, I get an advantage, I'll do more of it. You'll look at me and go, what's he doing? Maybe I should do it too. If there are adopters, advantages for early adopters, everyone does it. If I do it and I just end up basically ruination, you're not gonna do it, that's a mistake. So competitive advantage. Um, as you've seen with Google, as you've seen with Akamai, as you've seen with Apple, if you do it a million times and it gets cheaper per unit, if you do it a billion times and it gets even cheaper, then you too can start selling $50 to manufacture pieces of hardware for $2,000 too. So if there are economies of scale as you, you ramp up, then it's going to work. And of course, lastly and, and, and not least, if what works in my interests works in everyone's interests, it works. So those are the things that actually made stuff work on the internet that you just did it, and if it felt good and made money, other people did it too, we all ended up doing it. Simple as that. So, you know, political speak, what were our non-successes? What have we completely stuffed up? Um, I don't know about you, but, you know, spam is amazing, isn't it? Despite all of the cert teams and all of the this and all of the that, my inbox is still full of crud and probably so is yours. I employ filters, I employ spam traps, you all do that kind of stuff. But there is still an endless torrent of folk finding at mail addresses and sending out stuff to them. All the regulations in the world haven't stopped the volume of spam one little bit. And if you think that's a disaster, DDoS. I'm like, you know, if you regarded DDoS as an unintended success, because it certainly kept a lot of people busy and employed, then DDoS is a runaway success. Oh, and by the way, DDoS is a lowest common denominator attack. If you take away UDP, I'll just attack you in TCP. I don't care. There's a huge number of webcams out there that speak BusyNet or whatever that thing was. If UDP goes away, TCP attacks will still work. The, the attacker has an infinite toolbox and the defender has to defend everywhere. It's a hopeless game. We are losing. We will never win. If you need to put internet content up online and it needs to be available 24-7, no matter what, I can guarantee only three of you in this room run infrastructure large enough to do that. And it's probably not any of you individually. You know, there's only a few folk left that can absorb attack. There's no such thing as throwing the attack elsewhere. If you really want to put stuff up that is always available, you simply have to absorb the bad traffic. You have no choice. So, you know, DDoS, great success for the five folks still left standing in those hugely fortified towers. Everyone else is out there in the toxic wasteland. Uh, BCP38, right? <laughs> say no more. Um, secure end systems, say no more. I have this TV, it's, it's made by Sony. It has a TCP stack. I have no idea if Sony paid $1 or $2 for it. I have no idea what its password is. I have no idea if it's part of an attack army. And neither do you. It's just this thing that runs IP and it's completely invisible to me. And some idiots think that the internet of things is coming and this is a better thing than what we have now. Because if my TV set becomes every light bulb, every switch, every everything in my house and your house too, 
How is that better? Because, you know, my light bulb is not going to have a well-maintained $1,000 TCP stack in it. It's going to be some crud they picked up in a gutter outside and just stuffed into a chip, because that's how you put it in a light bulb. And, you know, in the... Sorry, has someone just done this? Um, <laughs> go Phillips. Um, and, and last and not least is, is IPv6 adoption, because, you know, we've been haranguing you for years and you've just been resisting. See the story about NATs. The network that v6 was designed for was a network we stopped using in about, ooh, 1988. That was the network of mainframes where everyone talked to everyone else. Just remember, you are the Facebook feeder network. You're all running clients. The few folk that run servers know what they're doing. This is a one-way network. And V6 was never built for that. V6 was built for a different architecture at a different time. So in some ways, exhorting everyone, you must run V6. And they've got to, why? Because the 80s were so cool and we loved the hair? Um, yeah, right. Um, so why are these things failures? Well, it's a bit like that DNS flag day. Flag days are really, really, really hard because no one's in charge, right? So I can't get everyone to do the same thing on a certain time anymore. You know, you don't and you won't. So if anything needs orchestrated actions, even DDoS defense, it ain't gonna happen. Um, anything requires all of us to do the same thing by fiat, whether we wanted to or not, won't happen. Um, if anything's in the common interest, but I end up spending money, it's not gonna happen. Why should I spend money to help a billion dollar company do its service better? Me, it's their problem, it's not my problem. And this kind of issue when common benefit and individual benefit aren't aligned, it ain't gonna happen. Uh, and if I do something and I just end up spending money and I don't get any benefit, then it ain't gonna happen either. And I could put V6 into that. You'll spend a lot of time and money putting up V6, a lot of time and money. Will it give you a return on your bottom line today? No, it's not. You still have to run V4 because there's a hell of a lot of V4 out there. So what, is, what has the adoption actually done for you? Well, it made you feel better. Filled up an otherwise boring Thursday. Yeah, fine. But, you know, it didn't actually do anything other than that. And, and that was the issue why this has been such a long and hard fight. So, you know, let's summarise why are things really, really, really difficult? Sometimes we just listen to the nerds too hard and it's just so damn challenging quantum computing, that we just don't understand what's going on. It's technically just really difficult. And we might understand, well, you know, yeah, I understand where you want to go, but I just have no clue how to get there, quantum computing. Um, sometimes it's just economically difficult. In other words, the folk who benefit aren't necessarily the folk who spent all the money. You know, if I conducted a lottery right here and now and asked all of you to put in a dollar, and then someone gets the iPad. You all feel good about it, you know, because there was obviously a winner. But if I get everyone to pay a dollar and I mitigate an attack on someone so the attack never happens, the winner doesn't know they're a winner. He just feels gypped like the rest of you that you spent a dollar and no one seemed to win, right? So in some ways, there needs to be a clear benefit. If there isn't a clear benefit, you're just spending money for no purpose. So Economics come into this really quite a lot, very basic. And last and not least, as humans, we are absolutely crap at risk. Now, I used to say that all those 40 million people living in California are nuts. You know, it's going to go. It's really going to go, really soon. Geology and all that. And here I am in Napier saying that. I'm like, what's wrong with me? Yeah, right. Um, so let's get back to the subject. Why is secure routing so hard? Uh, it needs someone in charge because with no one in charge and no one even, you know, no entity out there, this is just so tough. And what does it mean anyway? What's a good route as distinct from a bad route? What's the right route? Well, there's no BGP auditor. All of you, I would bet, in your default free BGP sets have a different route set Couple of routes here, couple of routes there. What's the right route set? I did this audit on Telstra a couple of years ago and looked at their default set and found that they were missing about, you know, 10 million addresses or so. Rang them up, hi guys, you know, used to work for you, I thought you might be interested in this. 
Well, no one's complained. Facebook feeder network, no one's complained. We get to Google, we get to Facebook, what's our problem? But don't you worry about default? Don't you worry about the route set? Well, I haven't got any help desk calls. So, you know, no one cares anymore. We don't audit BGP because no one wants to. And even when you do see conflicting route information, what do you do? Well, nothing. Just hope it goes away. Um, when you get an update from your customer, from your transit, from your peer, do you look at it? Do you check it? Do you alarm it? Of course not. It's just BGP. It's an automated system. You just accept it. And this series of opaque local decisions is what drives the internet. So little wonder that this is a really, really hard system. So you kind of go, oh, well, so what? Yeah, it's only BGP, doesn't matter. Why should you worry? Well, in some ways, this is now serious. The internet is everything. And for a determined attacker, it's just so easy to be bad. And comms, speak to the Swedes, who infinitely worry about the Russians. The first thing to go is comms. Because if you disrupt comms, everything else just follows. Mayhem ensues. So if it's easy to completely pull things apart in seconds, you're in deep shit when it matters. And so, you know, it's a simple kind of attack. I just advertise a fake route. I send it towards some site. I get your traffic going to the site that it was meant to go to. I can look at it. I can do all kinds of things with it. And you don't know. So, you know, some of you are rich. Some of you travel to other places. What if I hijack the Bank of New Zealand's routes? Not here, because someone would notice. But in, I don't know, where do you all do you go? Bali, Germany, just there. So I put up a fake site just there, just to get the tourists. Would the local bank know? Well, no, everything's fine. Would it even be obvious there's an attack going on? Well, no. Highly localised, highly focused, you can't see it, it works. So I just simply re-change the routing in certain parts of the network. I don't want to take all of you down, you'll get risky. But I want to take bits of you down in certain places just to capture certain services. Why do I do this? Well, I just want to be a pain. I want to turn off your service, just a DOS attack. You can't get there from here because the packets won't make it. Crude, kind of thing you do for grins. Hard to understand other than mayhem what the objective is. So, you know, let's get a bit more sophisticated. God, this clicker. Here am I getting more sophisticated and the thing's getting more basic. Um, none of you sign your domain names, you idiots. <laughs> because the easiest kind of attack is to get to the thing that matters, which is the naming system. And one of the easiest ways of doing that is to actually divert DNS traffic. And because we've anycast the DNS, how the hell do you know when I put up a fake anycast instance on routing? Me, it's just another one. You have no idea. And when I then provide fake answers, because you haven't signed your zones because, oh, it's crypto, it's too hard, it's whatever, you never do it, then I'm there. I own you. I am your DNS and you can't stop me because I'm attacking the basic name infrastructure and that's easy. So let's take this a little bit further. I want to set up a fake server that's you and you go, ha ha, I saw you coming. I have a domain name certificate. I'm running TLS. I have the secret. You can't do this. Gotcha. Yeah, bullshit. Um, Let's just look at this, even if Jordan does his job and all the registrants and registrars in New Zealand get protected with crypto and I just can't ring up my registrar and go, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I've really lost everything. Can you just redelegate my zone? Even if I can't do that, I can launch an attack. How? Well, I find a CA that uses a domain name test to issue a certificate. Hmm, I wonder who that might be, let's encrypt. I wonder who does a simple DNS check. Good. I find a domain that doesn't use DNSSEC. Hum, almost all of them. Looking good? Looking great. Because what I do is I do a, mounting, a routing attack on the DNS infrastructure close to some of these agents that give out certificates, like Let's Encrypt. And I answer everything perfectly. You can't even see me there. 
until that one question comes up. And it's not the CAA question. That's a bullshit question. It's the question that actually is the challenge. Do you own this domain? Yes, I do. Instantly, I get a cert of your domain and you haven't seen it. But I'm now there. I'm you. I can now mount a man in the middle attack. Who would do such a dastardly thing? Egypt, Iran, and other state actors who have been caught with their fingers in the till already. This is not attacking for grins. It's not even attacking for money. This is nation states, well resourced, well understood, attacking vulnerabilities in other people's infrastructure and getting away with it. Because it's insanely easy. So this is what we're up against. And it's really, really hard to defend. So there's the I want a pony list, because if I can clean up routing, so many of these attacks would have a degree of difficulty that says, go look elsewhere. It doesn't make the world cleaner. It doesn't make the world you know, infinitely wonderful. But it does at least mean you have to be a little more inventive when you want to do an attack. So my pony list is, I would really, really like to know if you're routing a bogus address. In other words, an address that no one has or should have. You know, I'd really like to make sure that if you're announcing my net, you had my authority for all values of me and you. The address holder's given their permission. Isn't that the right thing to do? I would have thought so. Um, you'd really like to understand which IS's can announce that route and which shouldn't be. In other words, what's the fake and what's real? But I need more than that because BGP gives you paths. And it's not just the origination that counts, it's how you get there. Because if I divert your traffic, I haven't actually hijacked it, I've just put it through a path that includes me and I shouldn't be there. So it'd be really nice to know if that path is real. That path is the intended path and it's consistent with routing policy, which is beyond protocol. Much, much harder objective. So I don't really want a cheap pony, I want the most expensive pony on the planet. Uh, and I also like to know when things should have been withdrawn and weren't, and when things were withdrawn that they shouldn't. Because not only does BGP announce, BGP takes back as well, it withdraws. I'd like to know that that's happening with integrity. So that's my pony list. Should be yours too. Because if we had all this, I wouldn't be talking. We'd all just be, okay, different kinds of attacks, let's move on. So what have we done about this? How far have we got? What's the saga so far? Does anyone remember route registries? They were invented before some of you were born, right? This is, this is as old as it gets. Uh, way, way back in the NSFNet days, uh, part of the solicitation that the National Science Foundation did in the US was inclu including this Route Arbiter database. Because routing was a mess then, routing's a mess now. The idea is, I suppose, really, really simple. Write down what you intend to do and put it on a wall somewhere that everyone can see it. So if you do something that you didn't write down first, maybe it's a stuff up. And maybe you should write it down first just so everyone can check. So everyone helps you be honest with what you intended to say. It doesn't actually matter what you said, whether that's right or wrong, but you've got to stick to it. You know, it's sort of, Say what you're going to say and do what you said you were going to do and you said you were going to do and that will be a lot better than where we are. Now, how many of you use routing registries? Right, I thought as much. A small number. Why? Well, huh, what's it good for? Bloody good question. You know, if I put a route registry against my transit upstream, do I really put a filter against 750,000 routes? Well, of course not, don't be stupid. So route registries and filtering normally applies to your customers. It hardly ever applies to peers or, or upstreams. You just trust them. You're yeah, right. How do I know when I peer with you that you're actually doing the right thing with your customers? Well, I don't know, just peering seemed like a good idea at the time. You know, do I trust route reflectors? Well, you shouldn't. Um, so this can work, but you've all got to spend a huge amount of time and effort to make it work, and quite frankly, all of you were busy last Thursday and you're not doing it. 
and you're not going to do it this Thursday either, or the next, or the next, or the next. But there are sort of more deeper problems with these route registries because you didn't do it for a reason. <laughs> okay. Um, you might say it, but you should not have said it, possibly. I could write an entry for a route registry for Net 10. Eh, Jeff, you have no authority over Net 10. It's a public address. What are you doing? And route registries really have a hard time understanding whether I have the right to say something. There's no authority model. When you pull an IRR entry, ah, the plan B of the... Why, thank you. When you pull a route register, when I write a route registry, I could write anything. When you read it, it could be anything. So how do I know if you're the owner of that address? Um, those folk who use route registries, do you comb the old ones? Oh, God, that's such work, isn't it? Getting rid of the old ones? No, you just leave them there. I might need to use it someday. I might as well just keep it there. How do I know the difference between current and old? Well, you don't. It's just all route registry entries. Which one do you use? There are about 30 of them, maybe 40. They all have different information. If I see something that isn't in any route registry, is it good or bad? How do you tell? And, you know, how does it scale? Because it's used so badly and poorly at the moment and such a problem. What if everyone did it? Would the entire system collapse? Oh, and by the way, if anyone's looked at this, who understands RPSL? And my hand is down. This is the regular expression, computer science version of routing policy. And quite frankly, some of the expressions you can do would defy any human to understand, let alone a computer. No wonder no one uses them. It's just, what problem is it solving? Can I do this quickly? No. Do I need to spend a lot of time and effort? Yes. Is this something I need to do to actually increase my revenue? No. Well, why do I do it? I can't answer that. You can't answer that. You don't do it. So, you know, route registries, meh, nice idea. The theory is great, but, you know, things are missing. What's really missing, I think, underneath all of that is truth. How do you know that I have the right to talk about 203.10.60.0 slash 24? ASCII lies. You go to who is ASCII. You pull down the entry from APNIC, ASCII. Obviously, you've gone to the right APNIC because who is is a... Oh, shit, no, it isn't. Um, it was meant to be a secured service and, and maybe I should be using RDAP or something. ASCII lies. So that's how you know the truth. Yeah, right. What a foundation. If this was any other industry, we'd all be out of work. Um, <laughs> So what you need is something much more tangible where I have to demonstrate the proof of possession of something that I should keep a secret. And one of the things we all turn to with that statement immediately is public-private keys because they are so good at doing that. I generate a key pair, keep the private key secret. If anyone else ever knows my private key, they are me. Simple as that. That private key is me. I publish the, pri the public key. Publish it like crazy. I sign things with my private key. Only I could have signed it. I can't unsign it. This is real, this is genuine, this is current. And my public key that all of you can see can validate it. That's a really robust model. I can only do this as Jeff. You can't be Jeff to do that. You don't have my private key. So digital signatures are just really cool. We should be using that in this space for currency and authenticity. Maybe we should be signing route registry entries. That's a thought, and maybe we should, but how? Well, as soon as you get to this space, you get the nightmare that is X509. A nightmare of standards that stretch over, again, the same three decades. And, you know, this is so old it uses ASN1. Um, the problem with this kind of stuff is this structured system is really difficult to deal with. The tools are arcane. Does anyone truly understand OpenSSL? And I put my hand down too. Um, I says, wizardry happens and the right answer comes out. Gee, thanks. Um, <laughs> we have these certificates, X509 certificates, that binds my key 
to a set of resources, a set of AS, a set of AS numbers and IP addresses, and APNIC, not me, issues a certificate saying, I allocated to the person who holds the matching private key these addresses. And what it really says is that certificate validates me as the holder of particular addresses. That's a really powerful thing, and quite frankly, it's the foundation of all the current work in routing security, because that takes ASCII lies and indeed bland assertions of mistruth and pulls in a third party. Where the hell did you get that address, and are they willing to stand by a statement, a cryptographic statement, that they gave you that address and no one else in this room or any other room? Strong stuff. So what we did is devise something that encapsulates that essence in a routable assertion. Uh, it was called, God knows who came up with this. I think it's Randy Bush. Although the words are so shit, I could have been responsible. No, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. A route origination authority. Uh, and this is a digital attestation signed by the holder of the address, saying, I, the address holder, authorise you, AS32, the unique ability to announce this address into the routing system. If anyone else tries, it's a lie. So only that, or a list of ASs, have the authority to actually originate that address advertisement. This would stop a lot of fat finger trouble. Because as soon as someone else goes, well, I'll just map this into IBGP and put it out into EBGP and cause a loop, immediately the origination's wrong when you do the map out. Immediately the rower says, no, that's a lie. The authority is dated and it has a die time. Don't believe this after a certain date. So old information can't exist forever. I can't repudiate it once I put it out there. It's really, really hard. I said it, I can't unsay it. Oh, well, I didn't mean it for you. I just meant it for other people. Doesn't work in this system. So it's a strong way of doing things and it has a lot of value. And if we all used rowers, I've got half a pony because only addresses that go through the registry system can be certified. If you just invent an address, you know, 1.1.1.1, and you didn't get it from APNIC, that's a lie. And you cannot create a rower for it because you just haven't got the right, the right credentials. Um, with a rower, there's actually a visible attestation, this thing should be routed by that, that AS into the routing system. And so the third bullet's there too. So the question you're all asking, yeah you are, uh, is half a pony good enough? A and the answer is, damn it, no, buggered it up. Um, it's so easy to take your advertisement, keep the origination, put up a different path and send it onwards. How do you win? Because rowers are just not enough of an answer. Um, if you do what we call sloppy rowers, where you authorise a slash 20, a 21, a 22, a 23 and 24, and you only advertise the 20, I fake a 24 with your origination, I own you. So you've done the right thing, I still own you. Damn. I'm going to do tight rowers. Okay, good. I'll just reproduce your routing advertisement somewhere else on the planet. Mayhem ensues over there. You don't notice. Oh, that didn't work either. So, you know, half is not all. And three out of ten is, three out of six is fine, but it's just not enough. Because what you really want to do is secure the path. And at this point, I've just ignited the thermonuclear bomb. Because you don't have the compute power in your router to do this, and you can't offload it if you want to do it in real time. And if you think all of that crap looks easy, think about BGP reset and you have to do this 700,000 times when all the route set comes back at you, all signed, and you need to cryptographically re-sign. If you thought the transition from two byte to four byte aces was hard, uh, this is just you know PhD material or worse. We can't do it. This is never gonna get deployed. It's just too much work for not enough benefit. And no matter how, you know, how expensive your router is, it won't do that. It won't do that in real time. We can't secure the path this way. Sigh. So 
AS path protection is one of those intractably hard problems. It's just one of those, oh shit, have we stumbled into this, you know, NP complete really, really hard problem case? Uh, yeah, we're just there. Really high crypto load, can't be offloaded. We don't know how to promulgate it. We can't do partial adoption. The entire room has to deploy this. You're all spending time, money and effort. And we don't quite understand the risk we're mitigating for. Uh, if you think this is going to be deployed, I want to speak to you because I really want to understand why you think that. Because, you know, I just don't. You know, it's, there's no hope. Oh, I'm busy pressing the next button. OK. What's going wrong? The economics. Which routes matter? That's a serious question. Which routes matter? My route, 203.10.60/24, doesn't matter. I won't give you permission to hijack it because that would be wrong. But if you were to, the economic damage the world would suffer couldn't be seen. I'm not important. But there are a few other routes, hmm, www.google.com, a few other routes that are really, really valuable. All the server routes of important servers are valuable. That small collection of routes that Cloudflare stuff all of their tenants into are valuable. Why should we all be spending time, money and effort to solve a problem that is actually only had by a few billion dollar companies? The economics of this situation are actually reversed. It's all wrong. We're all being asked to solve someone else's problem and that really becomes nobody's problem because none of us are motivated to do that. And none of the regulators or security agencies in the world can force us there. Despite all of the risks at a national security level and beyond, trying to get this industry to spend a large amount of money to actually clean up all the routes just so a handful of important routes get secured isn't going to work. That's just putting everything backwards. So this is looking really, really hard. Um, but, you know, I've been accused of doing depressing slide packs. So, you know, let's just, let's just go the other way despite all this. Um, <laughs> so I'll try and be optimistic. Um, there's nothing left other than keying infrastructure in the security world today. There's no better thought. If you have a better thought, great, let's use it. No one has come up with one. So we think our PKI certificates and public-private keying is actually good because we can't think of anything better. There is nothing left in the cupboard. This is as good as it gets. The AS path problem is a nightmare of a problem. Maybe we're being a little bit too obsessive compulsive. And far be it from me to accuse you folk of being obsessive compulsive, but you know you are, aren't you? Really, I've sat through these presentations too. You're incredibly obsessive compulsive. Relax. You don't need to be that obsessive. Maybe there are other ways that are a little bit more relaxed about this that kind of do tolerably good. Because you're not trying to stop the attack. You're trying to make the attack hard enough that they'll go and do something else. They'll rob the house next door, not this house. That's all you're really trying to do. So at the IETF, we are working on ways that do a lightweight version of path protection. That kind of go, well, if you faked this path, it's so close to reality, I don't care. You're not really changing the traffic anywhere much. You're going down known adjacencies, meh. You could have gone down there anyway. No guarantee of success, by the way, and the way the IETF works these days, over 20 years we've managed to convert a fast and nimble process uh, into one that is turgid and, quite frankly, God, I was writing something about quick this new protocol, the IETF is standardising. When was Quick first invented by Google? 2012. Has the IETF finished standardising it in 2019? No. We're fast. We are so fast over there in the IETF, blindingly fast. Um, if you're waiting for the IETF to do something here, you're going to retire first, I guarantee it. Um, so the problem isn't going to go away, and waiting for others to do something maybe isn't the right way. Maybe we need to think about this a little harder. Maybe we need to decouple topology and policy and so on. 
Maybe the folk who really, really have the problem, Google, Akamai, Cloudflare, Facebook, should be doing more themselves rather than telling us to solve their problem. Maybe it's their problem. And maybe there's something in that. Um, are client routes important or server routes? Like I said, I don't think I'm important. Economically, I'm not. But there's a whole bunch of routes that are really important for a whole bunch of people. Maybe it's their problem. Maybe the IXPs and maybe the CDNs are actually the pressure points here, rather than telling all of us we have to spend money and do work. And maybe there's some, some, some answers there. Um, in the meantime, though, the billion dollar companies are trying to do a forcing function on you. This comes from a Nanog presentation last year where Google is threatening, uh, January's over guys, that in January they were going to put route filtering on all of their peers. That hasn't happened, but the intent is still there. So they're moving towards route registries for all of their peers in Google. They're not the only one over at the Cloudflare ranch. There's a similar thing about its peering policy. If you want to cozy up to the CDNs, you've got to play by their rules, which means you've got to do their things. You need to know about some of this stuff because after route registries comes rowers almost immediately. So at some point, if you want your CDN stuff, you're going to have to do more than you're currently doing to cozy up to them to make your customers happy. So you can't ignore this. So what can you do today? Like I said, I'm going to be very optimistic here and, and give you a little list of things that you should be doing. Even if I'm not, you should, right? Um, you really should do BCP38 filters. I'm like, you know, you should. We've been saying this for 20 years and none of you listen, but you know, I'll say it again. You're not gonna listen, but you really should. Yeah. I feel good. You feel good that you've heard it, you know, fine. Um, <laughs> Where's the beer? Um, generating rowers can help. Well, at least seven ASs actively get rid of invalid rowers. Hopefully tomorrow it might be eight. Uh, generating rowers, well, I don't think they will help today, but you've got to get your head through it at some point because that's all we have. And so, like many other things, it's kind of inevitable, like a brick falling from the 50th floor of a building, it's going to hit the ground sooner or later. If you're the last person to do it, A, you know, you might be kind of caught out and you might be panicking when it happens. Rowers should be painless. If they're not, tell us and we'll try and make it easier. But you, maybe you should just play with them. Don't use them in anger. You'll blow your foot off. Be careful. Um, route registry objects can help. Um, but it's hard to say exactly what to do, but maybe Google will tell you what it wants and you'll have to do it anyway. So maybe you should read up about it first. Um, you should really filter your customers, particularly with BCP38, because you know it's your customer networks that have all these Sony televisions where the TCP stack is crap. And unless you can sort of insulate yourself from that kind of badness, everyone's got a problem. Um, <laughs> ISOC has decided that everyone needs to be nice to each other and they've even invented a web page saying everyone should be nice to each other in routing. Uh, great idea. You should, should read it too and be nice to each other. Hasn't worked so far, but you know, we can dream. Um, for Christ's sake, DNSSEC sign your domain name. Even if it's hard to say, the only thing we really count on insecurity these days is the domain name system because we stuffed up addresses so badly, all that's left is the DNS. If your name is unprotected, if I feel like it, you're mine. And the only thing between me and you at that point is my desire to attack. You're not defended, you're not even defendable. Sign it, it's not hard, sign it. Your customers should be signing it. If you have a domain name that is at all important, sign the bloody thing, because that makes people like me who are attacking far, far harder to grab it, so sign it. And while you're at it, and this is where everyone except, uh, uh, Vodafone, <laughs> focus, uh, are doing it, validate the answers. Check if something is signed, that it is signed correctly and the answer's good. Because what's the point in signing it if you don't check? So if you do all that, at least you'll feel good about yourself and you can go to lunch thinking you've done your work because otherwise you should have bought me that pony. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
crucified vote, nothing about DNSSEC. <laughs> um, I just wonder if there are moves, uh, either locally or internationally, around regulatory approaches here, so government agencies saying you must do these things? So far there have been none. About the only folk that I've ever talked to is that in Finland, there were two folk who worked for the regulator that knew a lot about BGP and BGP security, which kind of amazed me. But I have seen nowhere else that has even taken the slightest issue with a regulatory-based agenda, which strikes me as bizarre in many ways because we've done all these computer emergency response teams and, and so on and so forth. There is a deep understanding that the more we put wacko bullshit software protocol stacks out there in, in our world, the more vulnerable our world is to malicious attack. But one of the most basic elements of attack is the infrastructure, the routing and the naming system. Yet the engagement of the regulatory bodies with that particular area of infrastructure appears to be asleep at the wheel. Either they don't talk about it because it's all too hard, maybe, or they think we, the techs, have it all under control. Or I don't know, but we don't have it under control. It's just out of control. Um, would a regulatory impost help? Probably not. Would a conversation help? Shit yeah. Because we are operating this critical infrastructure. And, you know, some parts we just have a blind spot to. So no one's jumped in. Maybe we should all talk first, but maybe we should all talk. Any other questions? No. Thank you very much. Cool. Thanks a lot. Okay, um, we've hit lunch, so get yourself some food and some caffeine and everything, and we start again at 1.30. Thank you. <laughs>